today on Fish's Call Sheet, I have one of the preeminent directors in our business and someone who has really transitioned through their amazing career, and I can't wait to share her with you, uh, the amazingly talented and longtime friend, Jody Margolin Hahn. Aw, thanks for having me, Michael. No, thank you for doing this. I'm so excited. I mean, we're so early in this process of sharing, but you're one of the people that I really wanted to share. Normally, I ask people what their title is and kind of what that means, but yeah. are you okay if we kind of just share your career? With of course. Everybody? Of course. So where did you start? What was your first job in the industry? My very, very, very first job was I was an intern and I basically got the job from the UCLA job board uh, after I graduated from college. I was an assistant. See, these are stories you don't even know about me. Mike. No, I love it. Um, <laughs> I, I answered this ad. It was for an assistant to a producer. He basically made like dog training videos. I'm not even really sure what he was doing, but he was a, he had his own production company and he was working out of his apartment on Fountain in Hollywood. Okay. And it was uh, an internship that paid $75 a week, typing up outlines or pitches. He saw that I could write and that I could type fast and that I was helpful to him in helping, you know, kind of form his story ideas and, and pitches and that kind of thing. He said, well, you know, my wife who runs the soap opera days of our lives could use an assistant in the writer's room. Um, what if you work with me three days a week and work with her two days a week? And so that's how I really got my first experience working on an actual television show was working with his wife, who was the head writer of Days of Our Lives. You know, all of a sudden my, I, my eyes were opened up to the, to the process of uh, at least being in a, in a writer's room. Because I was an intern, I kind of did everything and I was able to see what the writers did and I was able to go on the stage and kind of see what was happening down there but mostly I remember doing a lot of research for her like she would say you know we really want to kill this character off and it takes place at a beach what would happen if he stepped on a on a jellyfish and so you know <laughs> so then I do the research and so anyway so that was my first actual job in the industry, realizing that that wasn't really where I wanted to be. And I looked in the back of the Hollywood Reporter, because in those days we had no internet. I'm going, I'm going way back. <laughs> and uh, in the back of the Hollywood Reporter was an ad for a writer's assistant for a sitcom. And I went in and I interviewed for it and I got it. And, and it was a sitcom that was starring Chad Lowe, Rob Lowe's brother. I ended up getting hired, again, because I could type fast, really. And I, I got the job. It was at the very, very end of the season. Mm -hmm. And I think I was there, I don't know, a couple weeks maybe. And then the show was done. So now here I was unemployed. But because I had done that job, I got a call from uh, a producer who had heard my name and asked me to come in and interview for a sitcom called Give Me a Break. Give Me a Break was really my first long-term job. I was, a, I was an assistant to the head writer for two years. And while I was there, I training to uh, be a script supervisor. I was, I was kind of mentored by the script supervisor there. So When I met you, you were script supervising. And for people who have no idea or don't know what a script supervisor is, what, what would you say, what do you think, what do people think that job is? And then what does that job really do? I would think that people think they supervise the script. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't, I think people that aren't in the industry don't really think about what a script supervisor does. I don't know that they really even think about that job. It's a very specific job and it's different from uh, in, in single camera and film than multicam. In single cam, it's a lot about continuity. Also keeping track of all of the, the camera coverage, which is a huge job. Uh, because you're shooting out of order all the time. In in multicam, it's really more about being with the actors and making sure that they are as close to the written dialogue as they can be. You know, throwing out lines when they need them, timing the the rehearsals, and making sure that when you're actually shooting that the continuity is is also there. And for people who don't know what continuity is, it's if Michael had to, had to drink a glass with his right hand during a line, that's right hand, right. And then we cut and we go back and we do it again. And now it's in his left hand. 
when you edit it together, it's not going to match. <laughs> so that's uh, continuity is a big part of it. But also shooting part of it, you're keeping track of all the take. In multicam, you're not really keeping track of the shots so much as you are the takes and the preferred takes, preferred performances, taking notes from the producers, following the changes when they're doing rewrites on the fly, going in and making sure that not only the actors know what the changes are, but everybody else that's affected by them, like the, the audio uh, crew and the stage managers or ADs and that kind of thing. It's an overwhelming job, I think, for a lot of people. I think it's a great, it's a great learn everything job and have an idea of multitasking. You have to have a special skill to be able to follow what an actor's doing, follow what needs to be changed, keep track of coverage, and then all at the same time, keep track of what works, what takes work, and, and keep everything kind of moving and keep track of the timing of the show. Exactly. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe as later on as we jump forward in your career as a director, a lot of those skills I think are gifts later on that other people don't necessarily have. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. Yeah. And, and honestly, there's a lot of detail involved, but I would say also your, the ability to interact with actors and, and be a fun presence on the set, you know, that all of that is a, is a huge plus. But Roseanne was the first script, super, script supervisor job that I ever had. And really the only script supervisor job I had because I was on it for four years, but I quickly learned that I wanted to move up the ladder. And on Roseanne, it was where I was given that opportunity. So a lot of people do script supervising their whole career. And it's a, a great career. It, it's a pretty uh, stable, usually people who are known for doing it well, like you were, stay in that area and, and are sought after because it's a complex thing to do all the jobs that we just talked about, but also know when and when to push with an actor when to engage how to interact and how to do that you you have this beautiful ability to do it with humor and kindness I, i've always admired that ability we transitioned through the roseanne show we got to watch gail mancuso who's a close friend of yours and, and mm -hmm. in some ways would you say mentor. yeah a mentor mm -hmm. and so as she transitioned up um became uh, associate director and then a director mm -hmm. i got to watch this beautiful transition of you becoming an associate director. So maybe you can explain what an associate director is and, and what that role is on a show. Sure, so the associate director only exists in a multi-cam sitcom where there are four cameras. And the associate director, the, the job has kind of changed through the years, but the associate director essentially is the person who is in charge of coordinating all four cameras and making sure that each camera operator knows what they're shooting at, at a, a particular time. Also is keeping track of coverage, like we were talking about, coverage is the shots that you need to put the show together in editing. That associate director is really like the conduit between the director and the editor and the camera operators. And the job, differs um, based on who the director is. When I first started doing that job, I was kind of learning as I went and I learned from Gail and I learned from Andrew Wayman, who was the director at the time. And I would sit with, this was still when I was a script supervisor, I would sit with them while they were marking their camera shots the night before we would go on camera on a camera blocking day. In, in sitting with them, uh, I really learned how to tell the story with cameras and how to eliminate shooting uh, too much or, or shooting um, coverage that you weren't necessarily going to need in the edit. Uh, but also in those days, the associate director would sit in the edit bay and, and put the first cut together with the editor. Uh, and that's something that doesn't happen anymore because the editor does the first cut. But in those days, that is how it worked because the director's cut was the cut and the associate director's job was also to go into the edit bay and make sure that that cut was being realized. For me, now I'm learning a lot of these things by watching you mm. and lucky enough to get to watch Gail and I've shadowed Gail and I've talked to Andrew Wayman over the years and, and shadowed mm -hmm. a few other directors. You're such an amazing director. Oh. And that transition going into being the director from being the associate director, that's a hard jump to make. You have to get the right opportunity. 
that opportunity came for you from uh, Amy Sherman Palladino. Yes. We, we met on the Roseanne show, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And that was on what show? Love and Marriage? Is Love that and Marriage. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. She gave me my first shot and it was terrifying and exciting. And I literally got thrown into it. She had promised me a, uh, an episode kind of how she got me to come and do the show well, we were friends anyway but and we had gone back to Roseanne where she was a, a writer she had confidence in me and I felt comfortable there because I was surrounded by a lot of people that I had worked with a lot of them had come from Roseanne so it really felt it felt more like a family but you know transitioning from that one job which at that time I think I'd only been an associate director for maybe two years. <laughs> it's not like I'd been doing it forever. Yeah, it was a huge leap for me, exciting and terrifying. But ultimately, I ended up getting two episodes of her show. But then it got canceled. I don't I don't know that it ever aired, to be honest. I'm not sure it ever did. But um, it was a but great you, experience. You made the jump, right? I made the jump. Yeah. And yeah. I think in our business, I, it, it's hard for people maybe outside to understand there's so many projects that you work on that are good, that either get canceled or they, they don't always come to fruition. Right. But they can be transcendent for you nonetheless because either a jump in position or the opportunity or the learned lesson. Uh, you know what, Michael? I absolutely, I, I actually think that for me, it was almost better that I kept getting on shows that didn't last so long because I kept broadening my, my horizon. I, I kept meeting more and more producers who could then hire me on their next project. I know people who have stayed on a show for 10, 12 years. And it's great that that, you know, you've got that job security, your job goes on for 12 years. But once that job ends, then it's, you know, nobody knows you sometimes. So I think it's, it's kind of, there's two ways to look at it. And so I choose to look at it that way, that for me, I was able to meet a really large amount of people by kind of going from show to show. Once I made that transition to directing, or I shouldn't say I made the trans transition because I got the opportunity to direct, but it wasn't like I went, okay, now I'm a director and now I can direct for the rest of my career. It didn't happen like that at all. In fact, it took me probably close to 20 years <laughs> before I was able to say, okay, I am only a director and I'm only going to go out and direct. And there were a lot of reasons why along the way I had a couple of kids. There was a couple of writer strikes along the way, you know, things like that kind of happened. But for me, I think, honestly, I was more valuable at the time as an associate director. To be honest, I really think that I kept getting work because I was an associate director who could be brought onto a show and could help any anybody who was in the director's chair because I had done that job and I was a, I was a really good support person. So I think uh, at the time it was, it was hard for me to turn down the associate director work because it kept coming. It really took me getting to a place where I said, hey, wait a minute, I'm gonna turn down that work and I'm only gonna focus on directing and that's when it started happening for me. Yeah, you have to take that leap of faith, right? And yeah. say from yeah. here forward, I, I'm pushing more for what I, what I really want. Right. It's and it's safe yeah. and stable. And it's scary. It's scary. I made that decision. And once I made it, I just, I kept going, which was awesome. Well, I'm going to brag for you because you're super humble. I've watched you across all the years, you know, after Roseanne and after the transition, I have come to visit you on other sets and I've seen you across a multitude of levels with a number of people and you balanced being a mom and being engaged and being involved. And what I watched over 20 years was someone who built towards their dreams, but did it within the framework of building a family and valuing their whole life, not just the career. And it's so admirable to me. It's one of the things about you that inspires me. And on my journey, as I was transitioning back towards this business, I mean, you and I have kind of talked about it a little bit. You're one of the people that I looked at and said, okay, you can do it all. You sometimes just have to be patient and keep working and keep focusing. Your time will come and you'll be ready when the time comes as long as you're learning and listening along the way. Perfectly said. Yeah, that's exactly, that's kind of how it happened for me. And I never, 
I never look back and think, God, why did it take me so long? Because I feel like everybody's journey is different. I don't regret a minute of it because I was there to watch my kids grow up. Part of what I love about this business is that we don't work nine to five every day, five days a week, you know, 50 weeks a year. We, we work uh, two weeks on, one week off, three weeks on, one week off, then three months off, you know. So it really did afford me a lot of time to be with my kids um, and my husband. And I'm so, so grateful for that. So now as a director, I think things have changed, right? When we first started working together years ago, usually you had one or two directors who kind of did a whole season. Mm -hmm. Then you worked, especially as associate director, you worked in that transition period where people, I think people much like you said, because they didn't have anybody who knew them after a show ended, people started mixing their seasons where they spend, you know, part of the year here and part of the year somewhere else. That transition to be able to work with whoever comes in and being the associate director, sometimes it's interesting because you know where all the pieces are and you know the place almost as well or better sometimes than the person who's just above you coming in as the director. And True. your job is to be supportive. Can you highlight for people, that's a difficult job and, and not one that everybody is as adept at as you are. And I, I think it's a real skill that I think people can do in any field is learning to be that support person, to kind of come with kindness and humor. Without having a chip on your shoulder? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, <laughs> to be so committed to the project. Right. You know... I looked at it like this. It's a team sport, right? I mean, produ producing a television show is a team sport. So I always looked at it as I'm part of the team. I'm, I'm here to support and for the greater good of, of this show. Yes, there were moments when I, as an associate director, was like, oh, you know, I could do this better. I probably thought that, you know, <laughs> but I never let that get in the way because for me, Again, I was there to support this person that was brought in and to help make the best show possible. I also felt that in doing that, every, every single experience was a learning experience for me. Every single director that I worked with, I took the good and I left the bad. Even without even realizing it, I think I was, I, I was in a position to really observe on the job and see what were the qualities of the directors that I admired? What, what qualities did they have? Um, what, were the, what processes did they have? You know, it was almost like I was getting paid to observe, but at the same time, I was also doing my job with a smile because, again, I also really enjoyed that job. It's not like I, I didn't feel like it was a job that I was like, oh, God, I have to go to work and be an associate director. It's a great job. Yeah. It's a great job. So for me, it was, I just kept thinking, the more I do this, the better director I'll be when I ultimately do have that opportunity. Definitely speaking for me, I mean, this year on the Connors in particular, you're such a smooth, focused, but joyful, humorous leader. Mm. And, and as a director, that's an amazing combination. And I do think it's the multitude of people. You're one of the people that I really admire and watch really, really closely because you do it in a way, you know when to be firm. Mm -hmm. You're clearly leading and you clearly have a vision and a plan, but you don't feel the need to step on people or to be braggadocious about it or, or to be in your face. And it just makes everybody work better, I believe. You know, I, I personally think that all those qualities you just said, someone who is being aggressive or bragging or I think that comes from insecurity, Michael, and I am secure. I have, I have done it enough. I truly feel secure in the job. And believe me, you know, there were times when I felt insecure in the job, but because of who I am, even with that insecurity, it wasn't, I was never somebody who was, who became aggressive or bragged or or any of those there was never any of those negative things i prepare i like to be 100 percent prepared and in being prepared i know i've got my stuff down so it allows me to be comfortable and and laid back i don't feel the stress because i know all right i i have a plan but i'm also very willing to veer from my plan and to collaborate and to go where I need to go because 
that's that's what the job is you know it's especially when i work on the connors it's like come on i'm working with some incredibly talented people so it would behoove me to sit back and listen to everybody else <laughs> you know but I, I someone once said um when you walk onto a set you should immediately know who the director is i realized i heard that and i realized that it doesn't mean it's not the person standing in the middle of the room yelling and screaming and you know yelling through a bullhorn i think it really is like what you said it's somebody who is taking control but with kindness and with humor especially on a sitcom we're all people we all just want to get along and have fun and we're there to laugh and get the job done so well i think for comedy in particular which yeah. you know doing a multi-cam if the place is tense if the environment is tough it's then hard to turn around and be funny and have everybody enjoy the moment or have the crew feel comfortable enough to laugh. Right. And so I think that having a sense of calm and a sense of confident presence, I think is huge because you get those magic moments because you're not so rigid. You're stuck with just your plan. Right. Right. And also we're there to play. Right. I think that again, if you, if you have your, if you do your homework as a director, it allows you to have the time on the set with the actors to play. And, and when you do, that's when all, like you said, that's when the magic comes out. That's when you find these great moments that aren't on the page, which to me is the best. Like if you can, if you can elevate what's on the page, you know, bring some unexpected funny moment. That's the best. That's the best part about it. So let's talk about the Connors this year in particular, because you did our historic live episode. Did. And it came came about pretty quickly and pretty rapidly. So do you want to take me through kind of how you uh, jumped into the helm of a historic episode and decided that you would be the one to do this live crazy extravaganza? Uh, okay. Well, first of all, let me just back up and say that for me, getting the opportunity to just direct the Connors, not live. The first episode that I did was the Christmas episode. And that for me was huge because it was full circle. For me to come back 30 years later, right? After I'd been the script supervisor on the original Roseanne, and then to come back 30 years later and get to direct an episode, even one, one episode was, I can't even explain. It was it was amazing to me. It was really like I felt like okay, if I never work again, this was this was it. I just I just completed my my whole full circle. And, and I have to say, for us, it was the same way. We were all so proud. We respected you as the director, but there was also that moment of like, look how she controls a set. Look how professional, how how amazing she is at this. And we got to watch your your kind of path a little bit so it was full circle for us to enjoy we got to enjoy that moment early on we didn't know how many episodes you were going to get to do we kind of had a full slate and the schedule right, was i only had i only had the one to start with i only had the one to start with that's right and that's, that's what awesome. great directors do right you come in and you do a great job and you create new opportunities right and you hope that yes you hope you're not going to be one and done right that's that's the worst to be the one and done <laughs> right um so but I, I'm gonna embarrass you now, Michael. Okay. But I, because I, I wanna say this, because I know I told you how much this meant to me when you said it on the day, but I'm gonna say it right now for everyone to hear. I, I wanna say it was literally the first scene we were rehearsing and we got through the scene and we were moving on to the next set and you whispered in my ear as we were walking, welcome home. And to me, I was like, uh, I'm, I'm going to cry right now. I'm getting <laughs> off the cleft because it just, it meant so much to me. I felt that, but to hear it come from an actor and from you and uh, it just, it, it was everything. It just, it was everything because I, I knew how much experience I had in between being a script supervisor and then coming back as a director. None of you, you knew because you, we kept in touch, but none of the other actors really knew. And so they were kind of, gambling on me right they didn't really know what kind of a director i was going to be so for me it was you know in addition to it being that full circle moment it was like this moment of validation that i felt and that you helped give me when you said that so i digressed from the live show but so my my first episode was that christmas episode and i did it and it went great and and it was a lot of fun and then i thought i was done with the connors and and i was crossing my fingers for next season because i didn't think there were any episodes available uh and then 
again, our mutual friend, Gail Mancuso, who had done most of the episodes as a director, she um, had called me up and she said, my son and his, uh, and his wife are, um, are due to have a baby around early December. If for some reason she has the baby early, I'm out of here because I want to be there. Are you available? And so she, you know, she looked at her calendar. I looked at my calendar. I said, yes, I'm not working that week. Ultimately, that's exactly what happened is her daughter-in-law went into labor early. Gail got on the next plane after she had started the, uh, the table read, I think, with you guys or the yeah. production meeting, maybe day one. And uh, I got a call from Barbara, the producer, uh, come on in. And so that's how I got my second episode. And then, and that one went, well, you know, that one went great. And then that's when they started talking about what? Can I add one thing to that story? Uh, yes, I you may. There's two things that actually that I want to say is both of you have always been the type of people who love what you do and take your job very seriously, but family comes first. Yes. And I think that's a good reminder for people is that you can reach the highest levels and still keep your priorities and, and your belief system intact. And then the second part of that is the confidence to come in and say, yeah, I'll come in and uh, it, a, a, a day, yeah, a, a day's done, somebody else planned it. And it's nice because you, because you and Gail have such a great relationship because the transition is easier that way. Totally. But it is a compliment to you to say, oh yeah, not only will I do this, but I got this. And for us, it was like, it was almost like there was no transition. You never, there was no beat. There was no beat even to skip. We just went on and kept playing. Right. Well, and, and for me, I was so thrilled that Gail thought of me too, that she said, you know, I want you to jump in because she's always been a, a big supporter of mine. And like I said, she was my mentor kind of growing up. So it was great to be able to have that opportunity. And, um, and I remember all of us got together and or welcome to the world because her, her, her grandson had just been born and we did a video and sent it to her. We had everybody. So, so that was the second episode. And then they started talking about doing this live episode. Initially, I think a couple directors were asked to do it and were not available. And then Barbara, the producer came to me and said, what do you think? Do you think you could do this? And I had never done live TV before. But there was a part of me that knew I could. And it was because I started out, like I said, we started out in a booth when we did the original Roseanne. So, and, and I had that experience of having spent so much time in editing and writing shots and, and snapping a show and doing it all kind of in that old school way. And so I felt confident that I could do it. And I, I prepared, I prepared, I prepared, I prepared. So and we also had so much time to rehearse, Michael, right? That, so all yes, of they, that really they did a good job of that, is they did extend the week out and give yeah. us extra days and prepare it. And they kind of locked the script earlier than normal. So as a production, from top to bottom, everybody did a great job of, of really making that work. Right. You touched on something that brought me back when you talked about snapping a show. Yeah. Yeah. So back in the old days when we did the show the first time, there was a truck outside, which everything was linked to, which doing a live show, that's what you have to do. You link right. to the truck and it, it gets shot out into the world. And in order to change, you snap. And I remember being a kid and <laughs> sitting next to you in the truck uh -huh. and, and being part of that process. It is, in my mind, it's still a snap, right? right? And I think for some of us who have been around a long time, that's how we see it is camera two. That's when the three, cut happens, right? Yeah. yeah. A, you know, C, like in some play in the old days, it was more, One, more two, numbers. Three, yeah. Yeah. And now it's letters. Thing or a finger thing? Well, first I got to fix the leak so the outlet doesn't turn out again. When the smoke smell is gone, we can move the TV back and close the door. Oh, okay. So it was warm for a second when the flame shot out of the wall. I snapped the whole first day. And then by that night, I literally couldn't move my hand. <laughs> I ended up going to the uh, to the pet store and getting a clicker. clicker. Yep, <laughs> yep. On my way home that night, I was literally like, because I did. I had like a whole wind up going. Yeah. on. Like I was going like this, and then I I was getting like carpal tunnel or something. I don't even <laughs> get like tennis, tennis elbow, elbow from snapping. I was getting tennis elbow. <laughs> Yes, and then I went and got a dog clicker. <laughs> <laughs> then you come home and your your kids don't want to give you any sympathy for that. Right. All the stuff, the active stuff they've done, they're like, mom, you hurt yourself Wait. snapping, really? How many times could you have snapped in a day? <laughs> exactly. Talk to me when you're a pitcher. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? We're all uncomfortable right now. Suck it up. 
Hey, since you're in a bad mood, don't take okay. it out oh. When you look at the live episode, we had live news coming in. We had every aspect of production you pretty much can have. And then to know and to be so confident from all the things you've done, to not only say, yeah, I got this, but to lead in a way that was calming for all of us as performers, that made that show so much easier because we knew you had it all arranged. And we had, I don't know, three times as much crew multiple different 14 cameras <laughs> yeah 14 cameras <laughs> you know and it kept growing <laughs> is the thing right it started with like well maybe we'll get you one or two extra people and it's like well there's no time because there's no commercial breaks to go reset the cameras next thing right. you know it's like now we need two sets and then hey it's the middle of the week how about three sets yeah. and, <laughs> and to plan all that to organize it you know you talked about it being a team you know i have a sports background you know your boys played sports. We yeah. were sport fans. There is something about doing it that way, coming from a team mentality, like we're going to get together and put on a show. Absolutely. So obviously we talked about the Connors. We talked about Roseanne. Yeah. One day at a time. Um, okay. So one day at a time. For me, I got to work with Norman Lair. I mean, come on. <laughs> That show I actually got because the producer of the show was the same producer who gave me my first shot on uh, Love and Marriage, on Amy's show. So again, like I was saying before, you work enough, you, you meet people and then they come back and, and hire you for different projects. That experience for me was, it was great. First of all, to I, like I said, Norm, to work, work with Norman Lair was incredible, but great writing, great actors. Rita Moreno, uh, at the time when I did the episode, uh, I told Rita, because my mother is a huge fan of Rita's, and she kind of danced her whole life, not professionally, but she, like, she still to this day does Zumba Gold. She's 82, and she loves dance, and she's seen everything that Rita's ever, ever danced in. I told Rita that my mom loved her and loved the show, and she said, oh, well, she needs to come to the show. And I said, well, you know, she lives in Northern California. I don't know if she can come down. And Rita literally took me into her dressing room and recorded herself doing a video for my mother saying, Myrna, you've got to get yourself down here. Your daughter is a great director. You need to come down here, see her direct, and you and I will, will chat and we'll have a drink after the show. And she did. She ended up talking my mother into coming down and my mom came, met Rita Moreno. It was a great, that was, it was a great experience for me and meeting Norman, you know, he's a legend. So plus yeah, I got a picture taken with him, which I didn't realize it was a candid shot that was taken while he was giving me a note and I didn't even know it had been taken until it ended up in variety or something somewhere. So now I have that too. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I pick Norman Lear's brain uh, almost every ABC thing. He probably sees me coming at some of these parties and he's like, Oh, this, this, this writer, because he is so astonishingly talented. And so his mind works in such a beautiful way Yeah. as a writer and somebody who wants to write socially aware projects. You have to ask because you don't you don't get access to these people that many times in your life. And right. so I'm, I'm all about learning. So I laugh because we joke the last time he goes, OK, what did I say last time that you came to ask me about now? That's funny. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm OK with that reputation as the guy who wants to learn from the best. Absolutely. Well, he's brilliant. Talk to me about doing Mr. Iglesias. Mr. Iglesias is so much fun and talk about a love fest that show and it starts at the top it starts with Gabe he's just one of the loveliest guys you'll ever meet that show for me again that's that's another show that feels like family to me in fact yeah I love those writers I love the actors it's just it's a lot of fun and Gabe because he is the executive producer as well he gets to say kind of whatever he wants to say so <laughs> he can change change stuff on the fly and we laugh a lot on that show. It's a lot of fun. And again, it's a show that, that deals with, with issues. I think I'm, I'm starting to tend to really gravitate towards those kind of shows now. And, and fortunately, there's a lot of them around. You did a lot of shows for Disney and the Nickelodeon and that group. Yeah. But one that sticks out in kind of a unique way for me is Alexa and Katie. And for people who don't know, maybe you could share a little bit about that story because I feel like it has kind of a special tone. It does. So, so Alexa and Katie um, is a Netflix show. I'm going to say it's a young adult show. It's not really a kid's show, but it's a young adult show that deals with the topic of cancer. And it's about a 15-year-old 
girl who has cancer. And it really is about the love and support that she gets from her family and her friends. They all, uh, you know, help her get through it. And, you know, it's a, it's a real thing that people deal with. And it was actually based on the experiences of the uh, creator's uh, sister, I think. So it was a really personal story for her to tell. One of your newer projects is the expanding universe of Ashley Garcia. Yes. Now that's a special one because you got to direct the pilot, correct? I did. I did. Maybe you can talk about that show and then kind of the importance as a director of getting the opportunity to direct a pilot. Well, so that's kind of the ultimate goal of every director, I think, in television. I mean, for some, it may be to do a feature, but um, in television, uh, to direct a pilot is a very special opportunity because you're able to start from the ground up and you're involved in casting and you're involved in uh, early discussions with the writers and set design and all of that stuff from the very, very beginning. And it's, it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. So for me to uh, ultimately get that opportunity was super exciting. In, in starting the show, you create the family and you create the, the vibe that basically kind of stay with the show, hopefully throughout the run. And you also kind of have a, a say in who's hired and all of that. So you really are kind of creating the family from the beginning. Um, in fact, the, the actors joked around that I was like the mom, you know, the mom of the show, which is great. I'll take it. it the uh, Expanding Universe of Ashley Garcia is 15-year-old Latina girl who's a genius who gets her PhD um, and ends up moving to Pasadena to live with her um, fun-loving uncle who is an ex-football player and is, a, is now a football coach, and she's working for NASA. Her whole life, she's been very, very focused and, and very driven, and she's kind of been on, under her mother's thumb. So now she's, she's able to live with her uncle and in her living with him and also in her reconnecting with uh, an old friend and some new friends at the high school she is able to kind of have fun and be more like a, a regular kid. And he is able to learn to be more of a, of an adult, um, maybe father figure, but the, it, it, it deals with a lot of real issues with high school kids. It's a really amazing, special show. Amazing. As a director, you get to come in and kind of put your stamp when you're that original director and set a tone for what you hope is going to be a long run and, and right. establishing characters and tone and, and the way some of these people interact. That's a truly unique thing in our business. And it also is something that someone is saying, I finally gotten my dream and I have to put it in somebody's hands to make it a reality and to make it visually work. I you're believe talking about the, you're talking about the creator now. Yep. The creator has to give you. And so it's this, it's a vote of confidence as a director because they're saying, I believe in you to make my dream work, to be that mom. Right. Right. And, and, and the, the creator of the show, uh, Seth Curlin, this, this was actually a project that he had been working on for 10 years. So it was really his baby. Like he, he, he'd been living with it for a really long time. So for him to entrust it with me, yeah, that was, it's a huge, it's a huge thing. It's a huge responsibility. But it, again, like I was saying before, it's a collaborative effort. So as long as, you know, you're all kind of on the same page and working together, it's, it's th this particular project really, it really all came together and um, it was just kind of a love fest. Okay, as a director, Jody. What's the best part of your job? What's the best part of my job? Honestly, Michael, I love every part of my job, but I'm going to say the best part of my job is rehearsing with the actors. I love that part of it. I love the process early on when we're finding new things, when things aren't working and we're trying to figure out how to fix things. And I love that process. But, but to be honest, I love all of it. I, you know, I, I love when I get a script two days before and I'm prepping at home. I love reading it and visualizing it. I, I love trying to figure out what the cameras are. I, I love all of it. But really, the, the fun part is when, the really fun part is when we're rehearsing and laughing and having fun and playing. And yeah, 
It shows. It shows in the way that you go about it because I think there are people who are stressed about that part of it is like this joke isn't working or this moment isn't working or how do I get that beat to work? Right. But that a lot of times is where the fun comes from and where beautiful accidents like we talked about earlier can provide a solution or a laugh that was never really imagined. And now you've created something new that, that has a real power and importance. Right. Right. Okay. And I think yeah, for me, you know, I'm not afraid to be wrong. Um, and, and there are moments when we're rehearsing when I'll come up with an idea and it doesn't work and I'll be like, Ugh, who thought of that? Like, that was awful. I'm so sorry. I said, you know, but I think like, and that something like that, it's like it, that also allows someone else like an actor to, to feel like, okay, I'm going to come up with something too. And if it sucks, it sucks. And that's what it is. And, you know, we all just kind of, work together and and try new things and when it works it works and when it doesn't it doesn't and that's what the fun is what's the hardest part of being a director maybe the hardest part is walking onto a, a, a brand new stage where i don't know anyone or i know very few people and i don't know the writers and i don't know how um things work there that that is the most challenging is going from show to show to show to show not all of them feel like family. And communication that. styles. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's just the truth that when you go from show to show or place to place, when you, when you come into a new project, some people are just have really wry sense of humor. Some people are really abrupt. Some people are really short because they have a million other things going on. Right. And trying to learn that dynamic on the fly while pushing through to make a project work. Some people love and have this joy in their work. And unfortunately, I've worked a few places where people almost have to work angry, like that's how they do it, or they feel mm -hmm. that's the way that it gets done, or that was the experience they had early in their career. You know, when you walk into one of those environments, it's definitely a different feel. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what it is. I think, you know, obviously, we all want to walk onto a stage and feel the love. That's really where it gets challenging, because then I have to kind of figure out how to navigate it and in addition to doing the work, I have to also figure out how to get everybody to like and trust me. So when you came into this business, what was your dream? Did you have a set dream? And how has that changed? I didn't, I don't think I knew that I wanted to direct. When I was a kid, I did plays in the backyard with my sister and my brother. And I always, you know, made myself the star and the director and made them the tree and the, you know. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But I think when I when I really got into this business, I was more I didn't I didn't have a specific goal. I didn't know I want to be a director. I want to be a writer. I think I just loved the whole process. And I really wanted to just kind of take it all in and and figure it out as I went. I think, um, you know, a lot of people go to film school and they know I'm going to be a director. and They make short films and they do all that. That's not the path I took. I studied communications in college. So it was a very broad general type education. Um, so it really wasn't until I kind of got my feet wet and saw what the different jobs were. And then really on Roseanne, when I started really being on stage and watching directors and seeing what the process was with the actors, that's when I decided that I wanted to take the path to becoming a director. But it wasn't, it wasn't something that I, you know, when I was 11 years old, I went, I want to be a director. That was not, it wasn't my path. I think you came by it organically. And I think that's part of the beauty of your journey. It's one of the things I, I was hoping you would share because I think it's okay for people to realize they don't have to know exactly what their dream looks like or know exactly what the end goal is. If you know what you love and you know where your passions are, you find the areas where you fit best. And it's okay right. to not have all those answers. And I think you, you have a son coming out of college. I have one who's almost done so but so much people want them to just know to have a clear path of their whole life and sometimes as parents we hope to, do you know right but the reality is we're all finding those paths right that's okay right it's true it's like my dad always said life is what happens when you're making other plans and and i love that quote because it's kind of true it's just as if especially if you're open to it right if you just and if you enjoy everything that you're doing along the way then I think it's, I think it, it'll happen, like whatever it's meant to be, but you have to be open to it. I, I don't think you can be, you can't be closed minded. You have to be open um, and take the opportunities when you can and, and always take risks, 
You know, I think I took some risks along the way and maybe not as much as I could have, but the risks I took, I took when I felt ready um, to take them. And so I have, you know, I, I got to where I am kind of in a straight line, but it, you know, it took, it took longer than some and, and not as long as others. So. Hey, but you did it with a grace. I think there's a grace and a dignity in that. <laughs> As a friend, I'll say that. Very definitely. Sweet, Michael. <laughs> so how do you motivate people when you're working on set and you walk into this new environment? Is there something in your mind that you set out to do? Or I, I know you mentioned admitting when an idea doesn't work, which I think is so brilliant. But what are other ways you motivate people or advice you'd give young directors? Advice I would give young directors. I, I would say learn everybody's name <laughs> like before you do, do a little homework before you get there um if you're if you're walking onto a stage for the first time i always try to go before i actually get the job and watch a run through or watch some rehearsal so that i can kind of get a lay of the land and see what personalities i'm dealing with possibly or and just see who's there and and just be open and kind and friendly. But I would say, don't pretend to know what you don't know. Embrace the people that are there to help you. Make them realize that you don't know everything and that you're open to any kind of help that they can give. But there's also a fine line because you don't want to be a director who comes in and it's just like, okay, everybody, what should I do? <laughs> you know, so there's... There's like that, you still have to come in with a plan, and but then be flexible and know that there are probably some people there that know how to do it better than you do, or especially in certain aspects of the job, there's probably people there who know cameras better than you do, or there are actors who know how to act their roles better than you do. So I think it's really about having a plan, having a vision, but then also being flexible to um to change that's perfect is it <laughs> yeah I, I do I, because i think it's it's incredibly honest and it is to me it's the best way to lead i've always felt like you kind of lead by example but you let people be good at what they're good at and let people use their gifts because if you come in you come in with preconceived notions and you've already decided what everybody's going to do and where everything's going to be and how everything is you are not acknowledging other people's wisdom or their gifts right. and you'll miss them. Right. And then I'm missing the opportunity to have that beautiful gift that somebody else has that I may not be aware of or that I don't have. Right. And I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. But also if I'm smart, I'm going to say, Michael, bring it because you do know more about acting than I do. Obviously John Goodman knows a little bit more about acting than I do. So when you allow people to give their input, it makes them feel more valued too, right? In, in any job. I know having been an associate director, when a director said to me, well, what do you think? Like, how would you, do you have a better idea on how to shoot that? Then I, I felt empowered and I was like, oh yeah, I do actually, what if it's this? So I, I feel like as a director, if I can do that with crew, with actors, with you know, camera operators to a certain extent, it, it only makes everyone feel like they're more valued and they're more part of the process. So okay. we've talked about blocking. Blocking yep. is basically anywhere that we as actors are positioned and move, but you guide us. So maybe take us through a little bit of an idea of that process and what that means in your vision. To start with, I, I like movement um, <laughs> because I think that people tend to be multitasking a lot and doing things as they're talking and it keeps scenes alive. Sometimes it really can help the comedy, but I don't have actors move just for movement's sake. I like to give them reasons for everything that they do. When I, when I first sit down with a script, I read it and then I kind of visualize where's everyone gonna be in the room. There are some things that I think maybe would play funnier if the two people were together and then I think about what the camera shot is like while well, I'm trying to figure out the blocking at the same time and I think oh that would really be funny if he was standing next to John for that moment and then I think 
okay, what's a reason to get him there? So when I'm, when I'm first am figuring out blocking, I like to think of props. I like to think of business and business as we know, but not everyone knows is what are you doing? What are you doing in the scene? Are you chopping vegetables? Are you, you know, hammering a nail? What are you doing? So I like to think, of, even if it's not written in the script, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it'll say the family is there. And I'm like, oh my God, there's 10 people in the kitchen. The family is there. And that, but that to me is the exciting creative part one of the exciting creative parts of directing because you sit with that script and you go, okay, I got 10 people in a kitchen and the family is there. Okay. I, it's what time is it? It's breakfast time. You know, so then I start with that and I think, okay, they're making breakfast. Well, not everybody's going to be making the breakfast. Maybe Michael is sitting at the table doing homework with her, with his daughter. Maybe I visualize where all the actors are kind of going to start, come up with ideas about how I can get them different places on the lines. And then I suggest when we get there, I start out by having all those props that I thought about when I, you know, during the production meeting, I figure that out with the, with the prop master. And then as we go through, I see what works and what doesn't work. And the actors absolutely say, you know what, this doesn't work for me, or this does work for me. Or what if I do this? Or I kind of feel like I'd rather cross to the fridge on that line. And so that's where it all kind of, plays out and then I can watch it. I can watch the block. I can stand back and watch the movement and it kind of looks like a, like a ballet almost. It's like a play. And then I can visualize what the shots are as I'm watching and then kind of fix things as I, as we go. And it's early morning and action. It's early assembly day and we all forgot. We're going to be late. I have to be on time. And the first one is singing. Oh crap, they haven't had breakfast. All right. I learned a trick from a bartender at the casino. Line up four glasses with a touch. Got it. Get her cereal, get her oh. milk. <laughs> DJ, spoon, damn it, man! <laughs> If I'm watching it and I see, oh God, that's never going to work for the shot. It depends on who I'm working with, but I don't all the time like to say, oh, that doesn't work for the shot. I'd like to give a, an acting direction instead, you know, so that you're not saying I need to walk over here to be in a two shot. That's not an acting direction, well, right? I, I, I'll give you an example. <laughs> I think there was a scene earlier this year. I was off to one side and I think you said, what if you took the cup to the sink? Uh, put it away, right? Right. And by taking it to the sink, I end up next to, I think, for example, say it's Sarah Gilbert playing Darlene, right. I end up right. next to my sister so that when our yeah, other sister Becky right. says something, we both have a look and we're there to share the moment. Right. Right. And, and I think that's the beauty of it's not just people end up where they end up and we shoot them as they are, trying to set up two shots and three shots or group shots and then the right coverage for close-up so that you can see the expression on the face and the interaction. You know, some things, the more physical you are, a lot of times you want to pull out so you can see it. Right. But when you get into a moment that is very detail-oriented, a lot of times you want emotional. to be able to see. Yeah. yeah, it's personal, emotional. You want to be in where people can see your eyes and see the full depth of what's happening both outside but also a little bit internal if the actor's doing everything that they're capable of right so, but as a director it's your responsibility to be, get them where they need to be or help them find a reason if they don't have one on their own to get to where they need to be so that you are able to get that shot okay that's blocking that's blocking but there so, but also you know it's uh that to me is it's so much fun blocking because it can be a train wreck, right? It can be a train wreck, but then you, it's like a puzzle. You figure it out as you go. And the actors always have ideas and, and we'll, you know, and their as, input. As long as our ideas are, are beneficial. So sometimes I, on many sets, I hear actors like, well, what if I just sit right here? It's like, right. <laughs> well, exactly. But like, then that's, that's an actor who's like, oh, do I have to move? And that's funny that you say that because, Sarah, Sarah was joking with me about that too. She's like, oh God, I know we're going to have to move. We got all this business. I'm going to have to 
walk and get the macaroni boxes. And then I'm going to have to walk over here. And I'm like, can't we just sit down and do the scene? It's like, no. <laughs> well, you that's busy. families. And I think yeah. comedy, right? Uh, I know when we have kids in the house and, and there's stuff going on, we have pets. Like families are movement. It's right. people in the kitchen, people coming in, people coming out, you know, transitioning, talking across one room to the other, you know, what happened? Where, where, did, where did this thing go? Wait, did you leave the room? Like, yeah, and exactly. I think it makes it authentic. It when does. You add that action and that movement and the blocking and then finding the way to kind of weave and get the camera coverage. I, I think it makes it more authentic. I agree. Because anybody can, can sit four people around a table and shoot it, right? I mean, and to me, it's, and some things, some, some scenes lend themselves to that. To me, that's that's lazy blocking. It's it's more fun to to come up with the reasons yeah. that people need to move around and do things in the set. So, okay, now the tough questions. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, what's the first thing you look for on a call sheet? What time do I need to be there? And and honestly, my uh, on a call sheet. It, it says OC for me, on call. So basically what I look for is ESU, which stands for electronic setup, right? Yeah. ESU. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I should probably know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I look for the ESU uh, call time. It's and electronic then I, setup and utility, I think, right? Yeah. So that's the time that the crew needs to arrive. Um, and then I try to get there kind of around that time, maybe 15 minutes later. Um, I like to be there early. So I'm, I'm not a director who, who, you know, walks onto the set five minutes before we're going to shoot. I like to be there an hour early just so I can relax and get my bearings and chat with people and hang out and, you know. I think it's good to know what the day tone already is. Like sometimes you come in and something happened or there was a delay with a set or a props missing or someone's sick or there's things that are going to impact your day and the earlier you can find those things out and you can only find them by being there so right. i find i i go early because i i like to get the idea of what else is going on today or what's outside the norm right for today i also actually like to look at the call sheet and see who's on the crew that day um, because it changes. So I just, I like to know who's going to be there and um, learn the names if I don't know them. And so that's usually what I use a call sheet for. All right. Now, what's the last thing you want to see on a call sheet? The last thing I want to see on a call sheet. That's a series wrap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right? I agree. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody asked me the other day, what sound or noise do you hate? And I said, applause. Because that means it's over. Because it means it's over. And yeah. For me, that's the last thing I want. I love what I do. So yeah. I like yeah. to keep going. So it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. But I mean, you've, see, you've seen that, right? Se season wrap or series, series wrap is the worst because that means the whole thing is done. <laughs> and, and they will write that at the bottom. Of yeah, the it's, it's a heartbreaker. I worked on a show, going back to some of your best projects, Don't Always Make It. I worked on the show called Hits, which was Andrew Dice Clay's show. Mm -hmm. And I started Monday as a guest. Uh, by Tuesday, they wanted me to stick around. By Wednesday, they wanted me to be a full-time character. By Thursday, I was getting ready to sign a contract. And by Friday, right before our meal, we were canceled. Oh, God. <laughs> and, and so all of a sudden, they issued new call sheets that said series wrap. And uh, something about, like, wrapping out all of the equipment. And there's nothing harsher or, or more painful than that. And you know, this work's never going to see the light of day. Right. And, you know, you, I went through the whole gamut in a week, right? That's I got a, a job. <laughs> I, they, I, they like me at my job. They want me to stay and they want me to do more. We're going to do a lot more. And then, hey, by the way, go look for a new job. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. But, but it happens. And it's not what you want to see on a, on a call sheet. I agree. But in this business, you got to roll with it, right? That's what we, that's what we've learned. You, you got to just, there's ups and downs and you got to just kind of stay level headed throughout all of it. Well, I don't know if you've worked with him, but Reno Wilson was on that job. Uh, who's done a lot of stuff, including he's on Good Girls and uh, Mike and Molly. He was on for uh -huh. a long time. And I'll never forget, people were devastated. And he just turned there and said, hey, we have to finish today strong because you never know who's going to see it. Right. And the audience has no idea when they walk in that today's our last day. He said, but it's okay because it just means we're supposed to be somewhere else. 
So you just come do great work and then see what comes next. And right. that stuck with me. And we became friends from that. And we're still friends, you know, 20 something years later because of it. That. Yeah. So that's what I got out of that job. I got a good friend. And it's like one door, one door closes and another one opens, right? I mean, that's, that's a real, that's, that's something that happens in this business all the time. So I think we just have to stay positive. Now, what's your favorite thing to see at craft service? My favorite thing to see at craft service. Recently, I'm going to say um, cold brew. That's something that <laughs> I love seeing cold brew because it's something that's kind of just recently started being served at craft service. And I, and I kind of discovered it cold, cold, yeah. cold brew and oat milk, which is a great combination. But I'm also going to say, especially on the Connors show, I like to not only see at craft service, but I like to hear the music that Chance is playing at craft service. Yes. And I like to see my friend Amy Brown dancing around with her bowl of whatever she's eating. That's what I like to see. I like to come in and see people having fun, dancing, listening to music, and hanging out at craft service. It's one of the highlights for me of a day right. is when everybody's back there and being joyful and, you know, Chance does a great job. That's one of the reasons I'm going to have him on the show is he does a great job of setting a great tone. Okay. The music, the music always changes, right? Sometimes it's Frank Sinatra and sometimes it's Led Zeppelin. It just kind of, it's just his, whatever his mood is, but it's, it's, there's always people back there dancing and hanging out and, and bonding before the, the work begins. And I think people bond over food naturally is, Something I said to him, I think that's a, that's a natural place. Yeah. What's the one thing you hate to see at craft service? What do I hate to see at craft service? Fruit flies. <laughs> good, good answer. <laughs> it happens, Fruit especially flies. location. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, we don't see it on stage so much, but yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it. <laughs> Jody, how do you define success? Um, well, I think, I think there's different kinds of success. For me, success in my career, I would say, and this is, this is something that my dad said to me when I was in my early 20s, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. He said, if you can wake up in the morning and get out of bed and be excited to go to work, that's success. And that's always stuck with me. And I feel like I have felt that way from the day I started working in this business, honestly. Like there's never been a day when I'm like, oh my God, I got to go work on a TV show. It's just, you know, it's the greatest industry in the world, I think. But for me, the success of being able, for me, success is not only that I, I love what I do. I, I, I get up in the morning, I'm excited to go to work. Um, it is the ability to be able to support my family in a job that I find creative and a job that I find challenging and fulfilling and fun and changing. And, um, and it, it's a job that constantly challenges me to be a better person um, and be more present, I think. So, to me, that, that's what success in, in my career is. I love going to work every day on a set. I want to be there every single day. I get excited. I think, you know, your dad's really wise. It's great advice. And for me, in the interim times when I didn't work on a set, all I can think to myself is I don't ever want to go to another period where I don't work on a set regularly again. Right. It's energizing. I realized, you know, during this pandemic, <laughs> I realized sitting home, um, and not being able to go to work and be with my coworkers, who so many of them are my close friends as well, and not being able to have that, the, the joy of creating and um, the challenge of solving problems and all of that, it's, it really, it, it's something that invigorates me. I realize, and I'm also a person that just likes to be around a lot of people. Um, and being around a lot of people is, is invigorating to me. It always has been. And so it's very isolating to be in this situation where we're not able to go out and, and do what we love. But, um, 
Yeah, I would say for me, that's, that's success. I, I feel successful. I absolutely feel like I have found my groove and I'm in a job that I, I love and I want to do as long as I can possibly do it. But in addition to career success, I think success is also happiness and health and being in a place where, like for me, being able to do, do a job where I am able to support my family, give them opportunities and have the time to spend with them, my sons especially, so that they too can go off, be able to find jobs where they can wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to get to work. What's the one thing you want on every set? Kind people. <laughs> I think the one thing I want on every set is to feel welcomed. I'm going to say that to feel welcomed and to feel like we're all together working on a project that we can all put our all into. Okay. If you could eliminate one thing from a set, what would it be? Mean people. <laughs> Negativity. Yeah. It, Good people. It, hey, I think it, it's so funny. The answers a lot of times are kind of simple, but they're really deep. That's where the stress comes. For me, the stress doesn't come from, the fact that I'm, you know, running out of time and I've got 12 more pages to shoot, that's doable. To me, the stress comes from how am I going to deal with this personality? Because that's the unknown, right? That's not, not knowing what you're dealing with when you're dealing with somebody who is being difficult causes the most stress. So I'm going to say that, like someone who's just, who's just negative or, or not. Collaborative. Collaborative. That, was, Thank that you. would be that would be the word I would use. Thank you. Someone who's not collaborative because That's perfect. What happens at times is people can be talented and sometimes they have other things going on in their life. And I get that. But when we come here to collaborate, I need you to be willing to do so. Right. And and also someone, you know what, I, I'm also gonna say I someone who doesn't value other people's ideas, you know, who who just cuts them down or, or makes them feel like, like what their, their idea isn't valuable or worthy. Yeah. I think that's one of those things for me is you can learn so much. It's one thing that I really felt like we did well on the original Roseanne show is it didn't matter where a good line came from or a good idea. And I think there've been select places in my life and career where that's been true. And it's really important that you take a good idea because it's a good idea and it, is good collaboration mm -hmm. as opposed to worrying about who gets credit or, or where it came from. Right. Well said, Michael. Okay. <laughs> well, I have the advantage of I get to hear a lot of these. So <laughs> you got this down. <laughs> All right. So what's the best gift you've ever gotten from a project? Honestly, I think being able to do the live show on the Connors was a huge gift for me. Getting the opportunity was a huge gift because it meant that people were taking a chance on me um, and, and it all came together beautifully. That was a huge gift, but also being able to do the pilot of Ashley Garcia was, was a great gift for me. Um, like we said before, someone who put their trust in me, but literally handed me their baby and said, here. <laughs> so I'm going to say both of those things. I'm not going to pick one. I'm going to tell you at some point down the road, my goal is to be able to hand you one of my babies and say, help me make this dream. Yay. <laughs> you heard it here, everybody. So, so be ready. Cause <laughs> I'm ready. I, don't, I don't know that it's a gift. I look at it more as they made the right choice. when it comes to Jody. How do you want the people who work with you to remember you, Jody? You mean after I'm dead? <laughs> Just say, no, don't say it that way. <laughs> I mean, I I've known you for I so left. I've known you for so long. There was a time where after I worked with you, I thought about how well you did things and, and your amazing behavior. <laughs> let's not make it postmortem. Let's let's not go there. Because I'm hoping you left. Have your decades I've left. left. <laughs> after I've left the show. I want to be remembered as a as a director who came in and gave gave 110%. Um, and had a great time and helped develop a great project and was fun to be around and kind and that people like to have fun with. And, and there was, and 
that I brought no stress with me, I think. Well, you're definitely succeeding in that. I'll tell you, as a coworker who's gotten to be with you through multiple decades in multiple jobs at multiple different positions, you are a joy. It's one of the reasons why you were so immediate in my mind. You were so forefront as somebody I wanted to share with the world and, and acknowledge. Oh, thank you, Michael. Okay. Ah, you're getting me off a clump again. Well, good. I'm going to ask you an even deeper question. So... Right. Stay, stay in that mode. I'll, I'll direct for a moment. Stay in that, stay in that space. What is the legacy that you want your family to take from your life? Wow, that is a tough one. I want them to see that life can be joyful and fun and productive, and you can you can pursue your dreams without necessarily going in a direct path. What do I want them to take from my life? That's so tricky. Maybe I that, I, I, that I helped to, to bring comedy and joy to this world, that I helped, that I was a part of that process. But, but more specifically, I think that I, um, that I taught them they can be whatever they want to be and do whatever they want to do. And that life is going to be what happens when they're making other plans. I hope that I am teaching them by example, you know, both of my kids have come to see me on set. I think that they look at what I do and they think, God, that's a cool job. That's a really cool job. So hopefully they now realize that they too, whatever they choose to pursue, they can, hopefully find as much joy out of doing whatever they choose to do as I, as I find in directing. So there's this amazing thing, Jody. I've worked with hundreds of people, probably thousands of people, met probably millions of people over the course of all of the events and things I've done, and you stick out. You are one of those people who resonates maybe at a higher frequency or a higher level, at every level, and it didn't matter you know, now you're a director and you're guiding the ship most of the time, but the truth is you are always guiding. And so I would tell you the legacy I took from, you're one of, especially what I consider the really strong women I watched growing up, who managed to be kind of all things in all places, which is so hard to do in such a pull, particularly I, I feel like for women even more than men. Mm -hmm. And I always admired that. And I admired the way you could do that with a kindness and a joy. And there are stressful days. There's always going to be tough times, but you never let it change who you were and who you are. And you never made it somebody else's problem. Oh, thank you, Michael. That means a lot. Thank you. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for answering my, my multitude of questions and kind of giving people an inside the business view uh, of directing, but also script supervising and associate directing. I think it's super informative for people. I hope they really enjoy it. I enjoyed talking to you. If you'd like to be updated on Fish's call sheet, go ahead and subscribe or hit the bell below so you know right when we update new information.